Today, property signs for the 24th of June 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's show, we look at the negative impacts of high home prices, taxing times for property developers, who are actually watching the regulators, and signs of rising interest rates and slowing new home sales overseas. Rising house prices are slowing the economic productivity of capital cities across Australia, plunging the country into a housing situation that one expert has described as a human rights crisis. Astronomical house prices in capital cities like Sydney are forcing young home buyers to move further away from the CBD, with their productivity and job skills lost to city-based businesses. Professor of Property and Housing Economics at the University of South Australia, Chris Leishman, has said. Professor Leishman was the lead researcher on the new report from the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute, AHURI, Relationships Between Metropolitan, Satellite and Regional City Size, Spatial Context and Economic Productivity, which is released today. Long title. It's showing soaring house prices in Sydney and other capital cities were now so unaffordable that young people were unable to live near the types of jobs where they would earn more money to spend. There is growing statistical evidence that rising quit rates due to unaffordable housing and long commute times are already affecting cities such as Sydney, London, Toronto and Los Angeles, Professor Leishman said. Evidence showed that businesses were struggling to get the staff they needed at wages they could afford to still be competitive in a global market, he said. While other capital cities have seen rises, Sydney's property values have led the way, pushing prices well past those average wage earners can afford, the report said. Prices soared by a massive $103,000 in the space of just three months this year to a median of $1,309,000. Over the past year, Australia's national median house price rose by $81,438, fuelled by low interest rates, a shortage of stock for sale, and people's pandemic fuelled desire to buy a bigger home with more space. Note once again that Domain fails to mention the credit in the room, like too much credit available, pushing house prices higher. It comes at the same time as a report from the United Nations labelled New Zealand's housing market, which has seen median house prices soar from $620,000 in May 2020 to $820,000 New Zealand in May 2021, a human rights crisis. Housing had become a speculation rather than a house in New Zealand, the report said, also noting the lack of social and affordable housing and inadequate protections for tenants. And Professor Leishman said Australia was no better. I think we're directly at the point of the housing-related human rights crisis in Australia, he said. Australia has signed on to agreements for housing as a human right, and the UN admonishes Australia for it, as it has completely failed to ensure housing is available for everyone. The Ahuri research, undertaken with academics from Curtin University, the University of Glasgow, and the University of Adelaide, suggested that having larger cities or more satellite cities where young people could afford to buy or rent that were directly connected to capital cities where they could work. Productivity growth was directly linked to a younger worker's ability to stay in roles and be promoted and paid more, Professor Leishman said. Older people who are experienced workers and more able to afford to live in the inner city, their individual productivity is already quite high, but their ability to grow productivity is low, he said. Productivity growth is higher in younger people, and higher house prices displaces younger people and takes them away from innovation and jobs, he said. While many people had fled cities to regional areas during the coronavirus pandemic, it was yet to be seen whether the shift from the capitals would have an impact on city productivity, Leishman said. I think the jury is out. What will happen, he said. We are seeing people move to regional areas and working from home more 
but we're also seeing companies clamping down on that and requiring people to be in the office. People working from home are working longer hours, but they aren't really being that much more productive. And Leishman said state and federal governments had a big role to play in ensuring the economic productivity of the capital cities keep growing. Failure to manage the diseconomies of large cities, that is the high housing costs and long commute times, will reduce productivity and redistribute incomes and wealth away from productive sectors of the economy, he said. Property developers who change permitted land use would have to pay hundreds of millions of dollars a year extra in taxes under a plan by the New South Wales government. Planning Minister Rob Stokes introduced a law on Tuesday that would require landowners to pay the government or give it land when they sold or subdivided land that had jumped in value because of government decisions. The change is designed to raise money for the government from increases in property values caused by state spending on infrastructure and rezoning of land used by councils. They will hit landowners and developers who are allowed to convert farmland into housing estates. What we have never done successfully is, at the point of rezoning, capture some of the land value increases, Mr Stokes said. People are still going to be making a lot of money in these rezonings, it's just the costs of developing the land are captured at the point of zoning. Known as property uplift value capture, the New South Wales Productivity Commission last year recommended changes to the way taxes are charged on property developers in return for approvals for their projects. The government think tank said the existing system was not designed to cover the cost of infrastructure needed for larger populations and continuing maintenance costs. As a result, state and local governments must find other funding sources to maintain growing infrastructure assets, a recent Commission report said. The changes are expected to raise an extra $250 million a year in revenue, Mr Stokes said, taking the total annual revenue through the system to around $600 million. Industry lobbyists who have been pushing for changes in the system said they were waiting for details about how much the new system would cost. It would be a poor outcome if the new system ramped up charges in some massive way, said the Property Council of Australia's New South Wales Executive Director, Jane Fitzgerald. The Urban Development Institute of Australia, which represents property developers, said the detail of the changes had to be worked through, but it was concerned about the impact on buyers. Increasing taxes and charges won't help with the housing affordability crisis we've got, said Chief Executive Stephen Mann. Land taxes have been a big source of revenue for the government, and the New South Wales Treasury predicts the property boom has two more years left to run. The Senate has passed a bill that will establish an authority that ASIC and APRA are accountable to two years after it was recommended by the Banking Royal Commission. On Tuesday night, the Senate passed the Financial Regulator Assessment Authority Bill 2021 with amendments. The law's primary purpose is to establish the Financial Regulator Assessment Authority, FRAA, a body tasked with assessing the effectiveness and capability of ASIC and APRA. It will become law once the Governor-General gives it royal assent. When he handed down his final report from the Royal Commission, Commissioner Kenneth Hayne had called for a new oversight authority for the financial watchdogs, independent of government, as one of his recommendations. He envisioned a body staffed by three part-time members and a permanent secretariat that would report to government at least biennially. The Commissioner had also suggested that APRA and ASIC should be subject to capability reviews at least once every four years. But the new bill has provided for an authority with four members, including a chair appointed by a Treasury Portfolio Minister, the Treasurer Josh Reidenberg, Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Housing Michael Sucker, Minister for Superannuation and Financial Services and the Digital Economy Jane Hume, or Stuart Robert, Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small Family Business. So it's going to be an inside job. The other members of the FRAA will include a departmental member and two other members selected by a Treasury Minister. 
the authority will be required to undertake an assessment of ASIC and APRA once every two financial years, beginning next week, 1 July. And it will also need to report to any Treasury Minister on any matter relating to either regulator's effectiveness and capability when requested. Both APRA and ASIC have previously signalled that they'll be looking to proactively work with the new body. In the 2019-20 federal budget, the government provided $7.7 million over three years from 2021 to establish the Regulator Assessment Authority. The explanatory memorandum for the bill has acknowledged that ASIC and APRA are already subject to an array of external assessments and oversight mechanisms, including ministerial oversight and scrutiny by parliamentary committees. But the Banking Royal Commission had said that parliamentary oversight had limits, including the time available for committee members to prepare for hearings and the training, skill and experience required. The authority reportedly would be tasked with complementing and expanding on the existing accountability mechanisms that already apply to the regulators, not to duplicate them. Liberal Senator Andrew Bragg took to social media to explain that while the FRAA will not review individual enforcement cases, it will provide systematic scrutiny over the regulators' enforcement. For example, we expect the new super laws and Hain Royal Commission reforms to be strongly enforced, the senator tweeted. But consumer advocates have sounded warnings. The Financial Rights Legal Centre Choice and the Consumer Action Law Centre made a joint submission to the Treasury where they cautioned they are not convinced the authority, FRAA we're talking about here, will achieve better outcomes for consumers, which should be its core purpose. And I have to agree with them because, of course, this is now branch stacked once again with people on the inside supervising and checking those already on the inside. Won't work. It'll just be more of the same old, same old. Neither ASIC and specifically APRA are really aligned to the interests of consumers. They have other agendas and those agendas are more to do with supporting banks and the government than consumer outcomes. On the 17th of June, the Norwegian Central Bank's Norsbank Monetary Policy and Financial Stability Committee advised the Ministry of Finance to raise the countercyclical capital buffer requirement to 1.5%, while Norsbank indicated that it will start increasing the reference rate in September. Norway is one of the first countries in Europe to announce a tightening of monetary policies following the support measures put in place to mitigate the effects of the coronavirus outbreak. These developments are credit positive for Norwegian banks because they imply that credit risks in the economy have declined significantly, supporting banks' asset quality as well as reinforcing the current high levels of capital which protect Norwegian bank creditors from losses. Additionally, higher interest rates and a steeper yield curve will support banks' profitability. The committee advised that the countercyclical buffer should be increased to 1.5% from 1% currently by the end of June 2022 and gradually return to its pre-coronavirus level of 2.5%, although a specific deadline was not communicated. The buffer fell to 1% in March 2020 to provide banks with more flexibility to continue supporting lending to creditworthy businesses and households during the pandemic. This decision reflects the state of the Norwegian economy, which Moody's thinks will grow 3.2% this year after contracting by only 0.8% in 2020 in real terms. The Norwegian economy's response to the pandemic compares favourably to both the rest of the Nordic region and the European Union. Restoring the capital buffer will also signals a reduction in tail risks in the economy and reinforces the buffers that banks are required to hold against unexpected losses and they don't expect the higher capital buffers to affect the bank's lending ability. Norwegian banks benefit from strong capital bases, which were enhanced during the crisis by a suspension of dividends and strong profitability. Additionally, they expect credit losses to be lower this year compared with 2020 levels. Although banks have 12 months to comply with the higher requirements, all of the Norwegian banks currently comply with the increased requirements. 
Norge Bank also indicated that interest rates will increase starting in September 2021. The reference rate is currently at an all-time low of 0%, following three consecutive rate cuts in 2020 that totaled 150 basis points. The rate cuts were a response to the economic stress from the coronavirus pandemic, reversing a previous trend in which the key policy rate was rising. During the pandemic, both house prices and commercial property prices increased markedly and are currently at all-time highs, while household credit growth has picked up. Raising the reference rate will most likely trigger a repricing on bank assets and steepen yield curves, which will support banks' profitability. The vast majority of Norwegian banks' loans have floating interest rates linked to the Norwegian bank's reference rate, which should support a normalisation of house price inflation as mortgage rates increase from current all-time low levels. Although Norwegian households are heavily indebted, with net debt accounting for around 247% of disposable income at the end of 2020, because of high real estate ownership, mainly owner-occupied, they have very strong repayment capacity, even during distressed circumstances, as shown by banks' low loss rates on residential mortgages. And sales of new US homes dropped unexpectedly in May as elevated home prices continue to weigh on affordability and builders rush to replenish inventory. Purchases of new single-family homes fell 5.9% to 769,000 annualised after a downwardly revised 817,000 in April. The median estimate was 865,000. Shipping bottlenecks and high input prices have held back home building, contributing to skyrocketing prices for the limited supply of homes available. A silver lining to the report was data showing new housing inventory continued to increase though about a third of those homes have yet to be built. Home builder stocks slipped following the report. An S&P index of 16 home builders dropped by as much as 2.5% on the data, its biggest intraday decline in two weeks. Ian Shepherdson at Pantheon Macroeconomics said the sales drop might be a sign that demand in the suburbs has fallen as COVID-19 fears have faded going so far as calling the end of the boom. By contrast, Stephen Stanley at Amherst Pierpoint Securities called it mostly an anomaly. Aside from surging home prices, squeezing some potential buyers out of the market, I do not have a good explanation for the latest fall, Stanley wrote. Anecdotally, we know that demand for homes remains robust, so I am pretty sure this is not an indication of a softening market. There were 330,000 new homes for sale in May, the most since July 2019, and at the current sales pace it will take 5.1 months to exhaust the supply of new homes compared with 4.6 months in the prior month. The median sales price rose to a record $374,400 and mortgage applications have fallen sharply since January, suggesting that demand for homes is slowing. The number of homes sold in May and awaiting the start of construction, a measure of backlogs, has little changed from a month earlier at 276,000. The total number of homes sold with construction underway eased to 305,000 in May. And a separate report on Tuesday showed that existing home sales fell for a fourth straight month in May, held back by a lack of inventory and record high prices. Sales across US regions were mixed, with the Midwest seeing no change and the South posting a decline. Home sales in the Northeast showed a large increase. A new home purchases amount for about 10% of the market and are calculated when contracts are signed. They are considered a timelier barometer than the purchase of previously owned homes which are calculated when contracts close. The new homes data, though, is volatile. The report showed only a 90% confidence that the change in sales ranged from 24.5% decline to 12.7% decline. Damn lies and statistics once again. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high, price discovery and price transparency are hard to find, and then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so 
why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.